Hello, my name is Maria Piles and I'll give the seminar about microwave radiometers. In particular, it will be focused on applications. This is me on the left. Uh, I'm a research scientist at the Remote Sensing Laboratory at Universita, at Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya, UPC. I'm also part of the Esmos Barcelona Expert Center, which is a center created uh, especially for to spread the data uh, and generate new products of the ESMOS mission, which I will explain after. Here um, on the right, you have my telephone, email, and also the website of our group. If you want to contact me, feel free to do so. And here is the outline of the presentation. I'll start uh, with a um, few concepts of, on microwave emissivity for Earth observation. Then I'll just move on to show examples or uh, microwave radiometer space programs which are currently in orbit and um, principal applications. Then I'll just uh, show the future space programs which have microwave uh, radiometers on board. So uh, microwave emissivity. Um, every material uh, that is at, um, at a physical temperature of above five, uh, zero Kelvin emits um, an energy in the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, that energy uh, depends on the dielectric constant of the material. And um, this dielectric constant contains information of of its material. Uh, and then many atmospheric and surface properties can be derived by measuring this emitted energy at different frequencies and polarization. Uh, in particular, uh, the microwave region is located at the, at the east part of the spectrum that is shown in this figure. It covers from 0 to 25 to 100 gigas and it corresponds to a wavelength of 0.3 to 130 centimeters. So here in this figure you can see that uh, the atmospheric uh, transmission in percentage is shown. So in the microwave region we can see that there's a specific, uh, specific channels which are marked with an O2, H2O. Those are absorption channels which absorb oxygen or uh, water vapor, for instance. But then on the right side, um, on wavelengths around you know, 10, 20 centimeters, you can see there's a window. So the atmosphere is transparent. It means that all the sensors which are located in these bands uh, can see through clouds. And that is the, the very good thing of microwave radiometers. These window channels are used for land, sea, cloud, and precipitation imaging. So here you've got um, a table. On the left side there's some applications selected uh, of applications that uh, are derived of microwave observations. On the second column there's the spatial resolution of the observations. For the microwave radiometers uh, it is limited to 10 or 10 to 50 kilometers. But then if we combine microwave observations with all the sensors, we can get um, we can get information at higher spatial resolution. And this is why you can see this from 1 to 50 in some of the applications from 3 to 25. So the course the course part will be using the radiometer only. And then the radiometric sensitivity of the observations, this is the good part, also the, the second good part of the microwave um, sensors. The first, the first one is that the atmosphere is transparent. Second one, it is, it is that they are very precise. Their radiometric sensitivity is very high. It is uh, from 0 0.3, you see, to 2. So in the worst case, we've got a 2, uh, 2 Kelvin error in the measurement. So they are very precise. And then on the fourth column, we've got the frequencies at which these sensors uh, work. So they are 
the many experiments have been set up to see what are the frequencies at which the um, which the different different atmospheric constituents or land properties or sea properties are more sensitive. So, for instance, here uh, on the image of the down on the down right, bottom right, sorry, <laughs> you see that the the sensitivity of brightness temperature to a specific parameter of an ocean scene is plotted. Uh, I forgot to mention that brightness temperature is what uh, is a physical measurement that the radiometer is measuring. It's the product of the emissivity of the material per its physical temperature. Okay, so in this ocean scene, um, we can see that, for instance, for salinity, the sensitivity is higher at around 1.4 gigas. Uh, 1.4 gigas is then the frequency used to retrieve salinity. Then, uh, for sea surface temperature, there's a maximum at around 6.6, 6.8 gigahertz, and this is the one that is used to retrieve the temperature over sea. And then for water vapor, it's 21, and then for wind speed, you can see there are really, there are really many frequencies in the microwaves that can be used. So to name a few of the applications, um, we can get a, a vertical profile of the temperature uh, in the atmosphere, water vapor in the atmosphere, we can get wind speed and direction over sea, we can get sea surface temperature, sea surface salinity, we can get oil slicks, uh, information uh, over land, we can get soil moisture, we can get snow, snow cover, sea ice concentration, uh, continental ice mapping, and then also rain, rain rate over ocean and land, and then cloud leaky water content. Um, all these radiometers uh, are um, the retrieval of parameters from these sensors are validated using in situ measurements and numerical models. For instance, you see here there's an there's an schematic of a radio sound of a soil moisture probe and an anemometer. The first four to validate atmospheric retrievals, second soil moisture and the anemometer for wind. So here um, is a table containing uh, some of the current passive microwave sensors I'll talk you about. First I'll focus on the SSMI family, which is uh, devoted to measuring wind speed, cloud liquid water, water vapor and rain rate. Uh, SSMI was the first one was launched in 1978 then following versions were t1 t2 and the final one was ssmis launched in 2003 it's it's an operational so there are many smis covering the earth giving a coverage daily coverage and then there's the tmi which is a, a specialized version of ssmi which also uh, well which also has a frequency of 10.7 gigahertz and it is focused on tropical rainfall. So I'll start with this family. Uh, SSMI uh, is, uh, was a very successful uh, instrument. It was launched, as I said, in 1978, and we've got continuity of data since then mm -hmm. to present time. And then uh, there's many applications and uh, many many studies that have been using this data. So I'll just name a few of them. Uh, for instance, here you've got atmospheric water vapor map. It is sensed as an increase of emissivity at the 22 gigahertz frequency. You can see uh, higher values are concentrated in the equator and the tropics, and um, lower values uh, at the poles. Um, it's important to see the variations and the fronts in this kind of images. And then this is horizontal, but there's also uh, vertical information. Uh, on the right, there's cloud liquid water content. It's measured as a combination of the 22 and 37 gigahertz bands, and it allows to assess properties of, of clouds and uh, 
to see then the potential of uh, for aircraft icing. So this is dangerous and uh, it is an important information to take into account. Um, also, there's the possibility of retrieving rain rate. Rain rate uh, is measured with rain gauges around the globe and then with also with other other sensors. Uh, but the good thing of microwaves is its all weather capability and then it nicely complements the other observations. In particular, the frequency at 85 gigahertz is used <coughs> to detect the scattering of the radiation with the ice particles in the rain. And then the channels 19 and, 30 and 37 are used to, uh, to account for the absorption of the radiation by rain and, and cloud water. Uh, moving, moving from the atmosphere to the CIS, um, SSMI um, has, been, has proved to be useful to monitor CIS through clouds and during darkness. Uh, how, how can we do it? So on the left side, uh, there's a plot of the emissivity of frozen sea. Um, as seen by the combination of frequencies 19 and 37 and the two polarization. So we can define these two ratios you've got here, GR and PR, and then by plotting them one against the other, the, we can see where are located the areas corresponding to first year eyes or multi-year eyes. Multi-year eyes is considered a, an, um, a layer of eyes which has more than four years. And then we can also see the percentage of, of ice and water in the, in the sea. So it's from 0% of ice to 100% of ice in the same scene. So um, it is very interesting to quantify variation and trends in sea ice cover. Also to track the ice age, estimate so on the bottom right image, you can see um, an image of the thick multi-year eyes um, acquired by uh, SSMI in 1988, in the month of March. And then um, the multi-year eyes that is, that is measured in March 2013. So you can see that there's an important variation. In the image on the left, it was the 26% of the Arctic ice pack was compressed by these multi-year ice, and it it dropped to 7% in 2013. So, uh, practical uses of this information would be uh, for uh, navigability, shipping, and transport, and uh, also for better understanding the climate. The cryosphere is is critical. Um, okay, so as I said, having a long data record of data is very interesting and in particular uh, for the ice, uh, I like this image on the left in which we can see the seasonal maximum and minimum that was, um, that was reached in between 1981 and 2010. So you can see in the, in the top, there's the Arctic in March and September and uh, on the bottom there's the Antarctica in February and September so this actually variability is very high and it, it's important to to track it and monitor it so then in the in the graphic in the middle uh, there's the the Arctic ice stand and um, inside it inside it brown there's the, the average of the nine, of the period 1981 to 2010 with a standard deviation and then in color lines are the um, the years after 2010 2011 2012 and 2013 so we can see there's a new record low in 2012 which is 3.41 million square kilometers of ice only and then there's also a tendency that the there were uh, there were records lows uh, after 2010, many of them. So 
there's a tendency uh, to a decline and this can be clearly seen in the, in the graphic on the right with us the anomaly the anomaly and trend of the Arctic in blue so we can see this around the four percent three four percent decay per decade and then the in the Antarctic there's um, a slight increase Okay, uh, then I move to another mission from SSMI, uh, the TMI, which is um, a mission that is uh, focused on the tropics, and this is why it has the it has the um, heritage from SSMI. It has the uh, channels of 19, 21, 37, and 85 gigs, and then there's also the channel of at 20 or uh, at 10 gigs, which is focused on tropical cyclones. TMI is on board the TRIM mission, which gives information about the tropics. And it quantifies water vapor, precipitation, cloud water, and it has a very wide swath of uh, 759 kilometers. And then uh, in TRIMS, there's the TMI and there's also the um, a high resolution radar, and which is called PR. And this radar uh, has uh, higher horizontal resolution as you can see overlaid on top of the other information but then there's um, it cannot retrieve um, data in some areas of the field of view where there's no problems from the microwaves so <clears throat> combining the two instruments we can, we get a um, we get a better better um, better insight into what is the structure of of the cyclone and uh, its and its evolution. Also, from the combination of SSMI, SMIS, and TMI, there's a nice record of total precipitable water um, (TPW) that uh, that is a measurement of the liquid water that will be accumulated if all the water vapor in a, in a cylinder above the earth were condensed into liquid water. So that's what it represents and it's an, it's an important variable for the hydrologic cycle. <clears throat> you can see there's large values near the equator where the sea is warm and the evaporation rate is high and then and near the poles uh, there's low values because there's little evaporation. So what is important to look at here are the gradients that can show the position of atmospheric fronts over the oceans. And then just uh, capturing TPW data uh, for a specific, um, specific moment. Here is um, in December 2005, there were uh, very, uh, very intense floods in California and uh, they were the, the result of a plume or it could be seen on a plume that originated near the Philippines. You can see it clearly in the image. So TPW data can be used um, to predict this accumulation in these um, in these streams. And then other applications of TPW uh, well short term weather predictions. And you can forecast heavy precipitation, tropical cyclones and floods. Uh, you can identify atmospheric frontal boundaries. Also monitor atmospheric chemistry and pollution transport. Um, getting out for climate trends and uh, data simulation in numerical weather prediction models. So we go to the second big family of operational satellites. And they started, well, they are devoted to atmospheric temperature and moisture. And they started with AMSU A, AMSU B, and then there's the ATMS, which is the new generation. So <clears throat> starting with, with AMSU, um, uh, it works by selecting specific frequencies, which measure a specific layer and um, component of the atmosphere. So for instance, for water vapor, you see the image on the center, of the slide, you see there's, there's a peak of 
absorption at 22 gigs. So that's one of the frequencies that is in AMSU. Uh, on the right, there's the oxygen absorption spectrum. You can see the different bands that can be chosen between 50 and 70 gigs. And uh, some of them are also included in AMSU. So, what, what, is, uh, what is done to retrieve the vertical profile is to, to integrate all the, the measurements from the different channels using a vertical weighting function, as you see, you see here on the left. With this information, we can, we can see the trends, for instance, of the um, lower tr tropospheric temperature and we've got records from 1799 to 2011 on the top. You see the, um, the anomalies on this temperature, lower tropospheric, and you can see that uh, in the first two decades, from 78 to 98, there was a, a trend to, <coughs> to lower temperatures, uh, but then there's a trend to, to level warming since 1998 to present time. So it is important to, to look at these trends in the temporal in the temporal dimension, but also in the spatial. And we've got a spatial information as well, and it's uh, an image of that, and a sample of that is on the bottom, where there's the anomaly analysis, and then you can, you can look at spots with their specific warmings or, um, or phenomenons. That that should be should be studied. And there's also the vertical information. So this like a three D three D plot of the atmosphere from AMSU. Uh, there are many products that can be derived from from this from this sensor. And this is um, this is a composite of all the, all the products that can be combined from one day observations. So this is from rain and the, the multicolor from integrated water vapor, cloud liquid water, total precipitable water, snow, sea ice, temperature. Hmm. So there's only some missing spots and that's because <clears throat> there's one day but just having two days, three days will just solve the issue. And also there are polar orbiting so you can monitor sea ice uh, they, well, they are designed so you can see, um, you can study the, the cryosphere and the polar regions. The, um, the advanced version of AMSU is the ATMS. <coughs> ATMS is on board the NPP uh, satellites constellation and then it, information from the ATMS is combined with information from CRIS which is stands for cross-track infrared sounder. Um, ATMS uh, is able to provide atmospheric layers in and below clouds since it's, it works in microwaves. It's, it's a spatial resolution horizontally 35 and vertically it is 22. It has 22 channels. Um, when it comes to crease, uh, it works in the infrared uh, so it cannot profile layers in or below clouds but uh, on the contrary it has a spatial resolution of 15 kilometers horizontal and has a very high vertical resolution it's <clears throat> for, uh, 1305 and it is uh, it is very important uh, to to understand this number uh, because each channel is sensitive to a unique atmospheric layer or particular constituent and this leads to exceptionally very high resolution. So from the combination of the two satellites um, you can get a very detailed profile. For instance, there's on the top left there's an image of atmospheric water vapor data from ATMS of <laughs> one day in particular Yes, notice there are snow gaps because of the design of the constellations on a daily scale. And then uh, on the bottom, there's the use of these data, uh, which are really incorporated in numerical weather prediction, prediction systems. For instance, you predict uh, tornadoes, which is uh, a serious problem in the US. 
So some other applications, retrieval of water vapor clouds and precipitation, <clears throat> retrieval of atmospheric trace gases, yes, carbon dioxide, monoxide, ozone, and methane, and then from numerical prediction, as I said. Uh, the the next um, the next sensor that I would wanted to talk about is Windsat. It was launched in in two thousand and three. And it's devoted to to retrieve the wind vector. It's a 3D information, which is uh, intensity and um, direction. So uh, it has several frequencies. <coughs> the frequencies 10, 10 10.7, 18.7, and 37 GHz are very sensitive to wind speed. They're actually used to retrieve wind speed. Then the frequency 6.8 is added to remove the contribution of the sea surface temperature to the measurement. The frequency of 23.8 is used to mitigate the water vapor contribution. And then um, that uh, all these channels are used to retrieve wind, spe uh, wind speed, but wind direction is obtained because of using the um, full polarization and using two looks observations of the same pixel. Okay, so this 3D vector can be used to determine the, st the extent of gale force winds near tropical cyclones, identify the cyclone I and all the features, and then improve forecasts. Here are the an example of uh, the Hurricane Sandy, which hit, it, hit it New York and uh, the East Coast in 2012. And then uh, on the top, there's the TMI sea surface temperature map of the um, of a particular day, and then for that day, the information that Winsett gave us gave us. So there's on the top or top left there's the direction of the wind, <clears throat> and you can see also the structure and intensity of it. Then there's the wind speed on the central image. Uh, notice there are, there are white areas with no data. That is because when there's a high rain with this rain, there's no, the wind speed can't be retrieved. But uh, we can retrieve rain rate. <laughs> so rain rate is on the right. And then so with the different mm -hmm. bands, there's a complementary, complementary views of different properties of the, of the hurricane. Uh, I move on to the AMR. That's the radio meter on board the Jason 2 mission which is um, a mission devoted to altimetry, ocean altimetry. So uh, the um, Jason 2 has a radar on board and the radar signal is, uh, is affected by water vapor, uh, by clouds and also by variation in the sea surface. So the micro radiometer is used to to measure actually these three properties and then uh, mitigate the effect on the radar. So the, the 23.8 GHz measure water vapor, 32 uh, can correct for the clouds which doesn't have rain. If there's rain, there's, not, there's nothing we can do. <laughs> there's no activity. And then uh, with 18.7 GHz, we can correct for these wind-driven variations. Um, and then uh, there's the two exploratory missions, which are um, SMOS, that is on board the MIRA sensor, and then the, the Aquarius sensor. The two sensors have uh, L-band radiometers, and, um, and those are the first missions with L-band radiometers on board, and uh, they're devoted to soil moisture and ocean salinity measurements. Uh, this is an animation of, um, of uh, small observations during 2013 monthly. You can see evolution of salinity and soil moisture. Um, starting with soil moisture, um, uh, sorry, starting with uh, sea surface salinity, SST, it is, uh, it is measured in, in practical salinity units. Uh, one PSU um, equals one gram per kilogram. Uh, to give you an idea of the dynamic range of the salinity, 
The 99% of oceanic waters have salinity between 33 and 37 uh, PSUs. And the global variation of salt concentration is only between 3.3 and 3.7. So it is uh, it is a really it is a really challenging to retrieve salinity, but at the same time, it's a very key variable. So these two missions uh, have shown that mesoscale upper ocean dynamics um, can be resolved in high in high salinity variability areas. For instance, uh, the images on the left <coughs> saw examples of the Mississippi River plume in the first row. You can you can see the evolution. Then in the second row, there's the Amazon River plume. <coughs> you can see how it creates and evolves. Uh, the two vectors capture capture the phenomenon. Uh, but the SMOS has a slightly higher resolution, it is a quarter of degree, whereas Aquarius is uh, one degree. Then in the third row, there's the Gulf Stream fronts and eddies can be seen. And in the fourth row, there's the freshwater pool dynamics in the salty waters that are off Panama. <coughs> Here, uh, I saw the interannual variability that was observed with SMOS uh, between the years 2011 and 2010, and the same period observed by the Argo boys. It is um, an array of 300, uh, 3,500 profiling floats. So, uh, you can see that the spatial structures are consistent between the satellite and the in situ, and um, and uh, with the satellite we we can we we can have sanity with higher spatial resolution, and also temporally we we can have systematic the data, systematically the data, which is a great advantage. But it it serves really as validation since. Argo boys has been used since long in salinity. Then <coughs> there's the there's the capability of SMOS to to be sensitive to ENSO. ENSO stands for El Niño Southern Oscillation, and uh, it refers to periodic disruptions of the usual ocean and atmospheric regimes in the tropical Pacific Ocean. So you can see the um, the box there. Uh, on the Pacific Ocean, it is average. Uh, SMOS observation in that box are average and are shown on the left. There's the latitude in the sorry, the longitude in the x axis and the time on the y axis. So you can see that uh, there was a a positive variance of salinity uh, in La Niña when there was an La Niña event. And there was a, a negative or a, or a freshening uh, later on on that year, and that corresponds to to a period um, in which the in which a Niña period was um, was captured by the EN3 index. EN3 index is an index that is based only in temperature anomalies. And um, and uh, yeah, it's shown there on the top right, and you can see that it's consistent that observations from SMOS um, in this area here on the fresning are consistent with the boys in this in this plot here. It is seen by in situ and remote sensing. Remote sensing from SMOS are in blue and green and then the boy is in in red for 2011 which is the year we're we're studying and then in 2010 uh, this is what was captured by the boy so this is an area of, of uh, high interannual variability uh, and SMOS was able to to get that variability right corresponding to this area here Okay, without the pointer, it was difficult. <laughs> uh, 
And then this is the index I was referring to. So since SMOS was launched, there was a Nino event, which is an anomaly, positive anomaly in temperature. And then there was a La Nina event, which is a negative anomaly <clears throat> and uh, an accumulation of, of salt. So then uh, SMOS can also provide good monitoring of key oceanic thermal thermohaline circulation processes. So this is a Gulf Stream as seen by by a radar, ASAR. Uh, it can clearly delineate the the shape and the, and the velocity of it. And then there's the sea surface temperature gives this information. You can see that the boundaries are not as clear as in here. And then in the salinity image, you can see it better captures it better captures the the circulation in the stream better than with the temperature data. So usually surface temperature and surface, surface salinity data can be combined into and we can get information from that. Also, there's a connection that can be performed between surface sanity and marine biology. Um, for instance, there are fishes such as the Sardinella madarensis that, um, that they live in warm and fresh waters. Um, and then there's the other species as the Sardinella aurilla, aurita, which uh, lives in cold and salty waters. So we can see and study their migration patterns and um, and for instance uh, the the tuna takes um, and see the correspondence with that and the in the small images then this is this is also very interesting how how small sees the impact of hurricanes so it is it is it is known that uh, there's a, an accumulation of salt when when there's a hurricane, and it is clearly visible in this image. On the left, there's um, sea surface salinity from SMOS one week before before the the Igor hurricane, and you can see that from one week before the Igor to one week after it, which is uh, twelve days difference. There's um, a transfer of 10 to the 9 kilograms of salt. So this is this is really a lot. It reveals the condition before and after the passing of the hurricane at really different, and um, and then, then it means that uh, salinity information uh, can can prospectly be used in hurricane studies, prediction studies. Then, um, with SMOS, uh, SMOS is also sensitive to very high winds, so sensitive that it can also be used to retrieve wind speed. And uh, here you can see the track of a um, high type typhoon uh, with the different passes of the satellite. In particular, this was like three spots where it was very intense. And then, um, um, it has been demonstrated that there's a huge change in the brightness temperature when there's, there's a hurricane. This is the huge change. It is 41 TBs uh, excess. But you can see that changes in sea surface temperature um, of 6 species PSUs, which is a lot, uh, of sea surface temperature of from 0 to 30 degrees, just extreme changes, they cause um, a change in brightness temperature of 5 Kelvin. And here we are seeing 41 Kelvin. So using this difference, you can really, this is, this is why you can actually retrieve wind speed. SMOS has also proved to be, um, to be interesting for the polar regions. Here this is an example of the uh, of the capability of retrieving sea ice thickness. It has been shown that with SMOS you can retrieve um, sea ice thickness up to 50 centimeters. And um, it is important it, it is important to to control um, to control the freeze 
frees up periods, uh, these thin sea ice, because it controls the, um, the heat exchange between the ocean and the atmosphere. It can also be used to help routing boats <coughs> from one point to the other as a, as a function of ice thickness <coughs> and distance. Um, on the bottom, you can see the, um, the ice thickness as seen from SMOS in November 2010, and 15 days later, and 15 days later, <coughs> how it, it is increasing. Also, um, SMOS is also sensitive to, to some physical phenomenon in the Arctic, in the Arctic Ocean. So, the uh, rising temperature of this over the sea with this of the, the sea water is of 90 Kelvin, and then if there is uh, ice over the sea, this the rising temperature is uh, increases up to 2,020 Kelvin, and this is at Nadir. And then there's the information of the different incident angles. So, with all these, there's um, there's uh, there's the possibility of retrieving also other uh, other information apart from ice thickness. <coughs> so for instance, um, here on the left there's, a, there's an image of the sea ice fracturing in the, in the in the sea on the northern coast of Alaska and Canada. You can see it with the with the visible uh, with a visible instrument as we will see with our eyes and then what a small seas. So you can see the the ice fractures can clearly be seen. Also on the right, there's the um, there's also evidence that smalls can can see the um, melting spots in the Arctic, which is also a phenomenon a phenomenon that is that is interesting to monitor. And then moving to land, there's uh, at Elband there's sensitivity to soil moisture. So you can see on the right, for instance, two two images of uh, of soil moisture: the mean of November two thousand ten on the top, and mean of November two thousand eleven. So you can see the different patterns in this drought in northern Europe in two thousand eleven, and the drought is in southern Europe in two thousand ten. Um, soil moisture is important because it's a variable that links the water, energy, and carbon cycles, and it's the first time that it's being measured. Uh, it is also important to improve water management strategies, and it can help in preventing natural disasters, uh, such as drought, floods, or forest fires. And you can see here an example of um, a flood, a very high rainfall that occurred in the Buffalo Creek. And then that's the observation. And then a 20, 24 hours ahead, ahead forecast on the right, you can see that if soil moisture um, measurements are used, the prediction is very much closer to the observed rainfall that when no soil moisture data is used on the right. So uh, SMOS has a spatial resolution of, of 40 kilometers and um, it is, uh, it is good for global applications, but then when you go to regional applications, um, it is two cars. So um, there, there are several approaches to combine SMOS with visible data or with radar data uh, to get to higher spatial resolution. In particular, um, you see visible information. There's, um, there's an operational product at the SMOS Barcelona Expert Center, and uh, it has been um, it has been the basis of the development of the applications I will show you later. So here is the validation of this product in the Salamanca on the top. You can see the spatial structures that are present in the high resolution, which are not in the original resolution one. It must to be said that uh, we gain spatial resolution, but we uh, we lose a little bit of the radiometric accuracy, so it's a, it's a combination of the two things. Um, uh, there's a compromise. This is uh, this is in the southeastern Australia, and then uh, it's in Joseph Watersett. 
So um, one application of this of soil moisture data is in is in forest die off episodes in predicting them or explaining the episodes. So in the last decades, there's been evidence of uh, forest mortality associated with drought and heat stress worldwide. In Catalonia, uh, there's record of these episodes where uh, forest decline has been localized in, sp uh, in space. This is a program called the Boscat. And then in particular for the year 2012, uh, the affected area was of 1% uh, of the forest area and it corresponds to 20, 23.5 hectares. Um, using small soil moisture at one kilometer to to explain these episodes, the a correspondence was found, and soil moisture provided independent information from all the meteorological variables that were used in the prediction model. In particular, radiation, precipitation, land surface temperature were used, and then on the right, um, this the effect of a small soil moisture on the decline probability per species is shown. You can see, for instance, that the, that the most effective one was, is, is this, the Fagus sylvatica. It is uh, clearly a, a species which is not adapted to drought condition. But on the other stream, there's the Pinus halepensis, which is uh, almost insensitive to drought effects. And then there are other in between, other species in between. Another application is uh, forest fires. Uh, the objective is uh, to detect areas of extreme dryness of soil and vegetation posing a risk of fire. So this is an example of the maps that are currently included in the Barcelona Fire Risk Prevention Service. Uh, there's a daily bulletin. And then so much information uh, has been used since, since July 2012 and has been helping them to, to take decisions as to where to <clears throat> where to to be aware of possible risk of fire, and then some preliminary studies have shown that um, so moisture, low soil moisture is is explaining the um, um, is explaining a uh, big forest fires, but it's not that critical in small forest fires of less than one hectare. And that tends, that explains, or our understanding of that is that it is a risk of fire propagation, uh, not of ignition. Another application uh, is uh, is floods, detecting floods, and then uh, we we have chosen this episode um, of Victoria of floods in Victoria and southeastern Australia. Um, there was a high intensity rainfall in January 2011 and so there were wet conditions prior to prior to the floods and then on top of that there was a there was a, a jassy and jassy which is a cyclone was afterwards uh, is flooding the whole area so here is this um, the zoom of the the zoom of the affected area as seen by SMOS on the 2nd of February. So uh, on that day um, there was there was actually no rain if you see the Bureau of Meteorology but the area was already affected so uh, the the state of the soil pri uh, prior to uh, to the rainfall is very important in the flood. So when it, if it is already very wet, then the flood will have a higher effect. And um, in this flood, you can see the cities that had to be evacuated. And as you can see there, most of them are located in, in areas of, of high value of, of soil moisture accumulated prior, prior to the rain. The entry areas are, are due to the visible data that are used in the, um, in the downscaling into, the, into getting the one kilometer product. And then this, the, the last current um, microwave, microwave radiometer. It is, um, 
it is not uh, it is not designed and launched to study the earth but to study the um, jupiter atmosphere so it is a uh, it is juno this will be the second micro instrument to explore the planets the first one was sent to venus um, to Venus, and then uh, this one in Jupiter. This is a this is a huge instrument. Wait, sorry, this it has uh, three solar panels of two per nine meters. It's actually the largest planetary mission ever launched, and um, its its aim is measuring the temperature profile at six different wavelengths and and at the pressure of of Jupiter. It's it's uh, already on its way, and it arrived, it, its arrival to Jupiter will be in 2016. So all this is um, for current satellites, and then a future passive microwave observation missions, and are here in this slide. On the left, you can see this map: so Moisture Active Passive Mission of the of NASA. It, it is uh, the logical continuation of SMOS. Uh, it has, uh, apart from a micro radiometer, it has also a radar on board. So it will provide a um, microwave only product of 40 kilometers of moisture, and then two additional products of 10 and 3 kilometers, which are result from the combination of the ra or ra radar only information. Then there's a new product, which will be the root zone soil moisture. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned it, but the soil moisture measure by L-band is the uh, top surface, it's the top 5, million, five centimeters. And then uh, uh, using data simulation with this map, uh, they will provide a product at the root zone, which is the area where the, the roots of the vegetation are located and it is critical for agriculture. Then there's also, they also uh, plan to give uh, vegetation health indication uh, indicators and uh, provide free, the free soil state. So this is when it comes to observations, land observations, and then when it comes to atmospheric observations, there are three microwave sondas which are, um, which are going to be launched. One is Geostar from the NASA, the other is GIMS from China, and the other is gas from the from the ESA, the European Space Agency. But uh, the particularity of those is that they'll be geostationary. That means that they will have a high ruby sail on the areas they're pointing at. So we'll, and then they will provide a, actually a vertical profile of the atmosphere of the area they're covering every half an hour. So this was all I wanted to have prepared to, to show you about microwave radiometers and applications. I hope to have given a complete overview and that was all. Thank you. Thank you for your attention.